What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. It's uh, your co-host, Craig, and I'm here with Pete today, and we're solo talking about the best part of our practice, the most, um, the driver of our practices. Um, We've got some cool statistics to share, and it prompted us to talk about who's really leading the practice. And uh, Pete, why don't you jump in and talk about who who we believe that is. Yeah, so we always kind of talk about, well, I should start out with this by saying that, Craig, some dentists will come to us and, you know, they're kind of grumpy pants about their hygiene department, whether that's uh, because they feel like it's a lost leader, because they feel like they're just kind of managing disease. Um, And you and I have a different take on it. And I really feel like the hygienists are the MVPs of dentistry. Um, And I say that because a lot of things are curated from the hygiene department, meaning new patients will come in through there. Um, hygienists can set things up to really enroll quality, complete health kind of dentistry from a, from a periodontal perspective, also from a restorative perspective. They really make the jobs, the dentist jobs very easy. Um, it, a quality hygienist can make the dentist jobs very easy. Literally, Greg, you can go into an operatory with a great hygienist, do what's called a, a, a trust transfer or a handoff. And you can just sit there and shake your head like, it, you know, meaning they can say, I, you know, we talked about this crack and this tooth and we talked about doing some you know, deep cleaning and some, and some gum therapy. And you can say, yeah, I just really agree with all this. This is great. Let's get you scheduled and walk out the room. So I know I just went on a rant there a little bit, but, um, but a quality hygiene program is not a loss leader. Yeah. Um, and I also do believe that it's, it's just interesting to talk about um, this idea that, uh, that, you know, we, we see a lot of dentists like, oh, my hygienist is a prima donna and it's so difficult to, you know, in California, you have to pay him all this money and they, they, they don't sharpen the instruments, they don't do this stuff. And there's a lot of negative banter of the dentist trying to discuss the, the, um, the prima donna or spoiled hygienist. And, and in actuality, Pete and I, we never have those conversations. I've never had a private conversation with you where, where we really feel that way. Um, and, and we were just putting together some statistics for our upcoming summit on February 27th. And I didn't realize this because I didn't do the math quickly enough. But Pete and I, in, from 2018 to 19, we both grew the hygiene department or the hygiene department of both of our practices grew exactly 23%. I mean, what are the chances of that, that, um, that both of them grew 23% from 1.5 to 1.9? I ran those numbers again, and I was actually 23.1%. Just, just for full disclosure, and you were 23. So oh, okay, every, there's always got to so, be a winner. There's there always got to be a winner. It's not a draw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for pointing that out. But, but it's funny because we, we have this idea that the hygienist is a powerhouse and the MVP of the practice, and we see so much revenue opportunity coming from those rooms. And um, also, they, they hold the relationship with the, with the practice as well. A mm-hmm. dentist, the dentist in the practice, the patient will come see you, you know, maybe once a year for an exam or for an emergency, but we don't <laughs> usually bond because there's a lot of patients that are in every three and four it's months. It's funny you say that actually, because we as dentists think like, you know, we are the reason that people typically come to the practice. <laughs> and in actuality, like the hygienist and the, and the assistants have way more of a relationship from a yeah. time perspective and, you know, rapport that, uh, you know, it, it's funny. We think like, oh, if I left this practice or I went somewhere down the road, my patients would follow me regardless of my team. And like, meh. Probably yeah, not so much, true. Not so much, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's it's also they get to they do a, a preventative thing. So oftentimes the patients are seeing us for actual work, feeling something negative. They they don't associate a cleaning with something negative. So it's just really cool that they have that relationship. But um, you know, with dental intel, I, I um, I'm uh, I'm I'm aware that we can see what type of percentages of cases are being accepted that are coming out of the different hygiene rooms. So we'll see like. Dr. Mike with Brittany versus Dr. Mike mm-hmm. with Janet. And even though, you know, I may have a better relationship with Jane than Debbie, it's funny to see that Debbie is, you know, I'm getting hundreds of thousands of dollars more dentistry accepted when I'm with Jane than with Debbie. It's just wild to see that stuff. Yeah, that, that was, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boast on uh, Dental Intel for a second because, or brag on them, I should say. That was the one, when you introduced me to that company, that was the one piece of Intel that I saw from a data perspective that gamified the relationship of, oh, you know, hygienist A and Dr. B kind of thing, or, you know, and, and where do you kind of correlate the, you know, who performs the best and you, and they literally give you the data. And, and I kind of made the executive decision. I was like, okay, you, you are now kind of the team and you are now a team based on data and a long, long set of data. 
Um, yep. So if you have multiple hygienists and multiple doctors, that would behoove you to look at that data set, just like you were indicating, Greg. And it's funny, you don't really know. I mean, that's why numbers are so important. Everything can feel really good and you can feel really busy. And I always say dentists have two needs. They need to be making money and be profitable, mm -hmm. but independent of that need, they need to be busy. And that's, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. I mean, my goal. Well, my, I, I, let's not make that sweeping generalization. I'm going to get, I'm going to get Mark on the podcast for to, to crack on you for a uh, Another sweeping generalization. Oh, Mark Cooper. Yeah. yeah. He, he'd, he'd he loves, all over he me loves for that to crush one. you for, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was an episode with Mark Cooper. You can go dig it out of our, uh, out of the files and Mark, um, just completely mid podcast stopped and ripped me a, ripped me apart. It was, it was pretty funny. Um, it was awesome. I just yeah, sat back awesome. with like a, my shit eating grin. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I'm going to get someone to show you a part two. Uh, but um, yeah, it was, it was a generalization about millennials and he just freaked out on me saying you can't generalize a whole genera generation. And I, I agree. But there are a lot of dentists out there that. What do you, uh, let's, pat, let's unpack the 23% because I think that's where people's probably in. So what do you attribute the 23% change this year to in your hygiene team? And, and look, at a practice your size, that ain't a small number. Yeah, that was, uh, you, know, you know, that's and, over and, probably. Well, we three. had the same exact numbers. We were both at one five and we both approached one nine. I know, so but I wasn't trying to both say, oh, I practice my size. It's easier when I can kind of, I, I can brag on you there, buddy. I can humble brag well, listen, for you. Well, listen, it was, we didn't, we actually lost the powerful hygienist. That we, we had our top producer in 2018 leave, mid-2018. So, mm -hmm. um. Was it mid-2018? Yeah, about mid-2018. So she was our number one producer. She uh, had been there the longest, and she held the record for most collections per month. And by the way, the numbers that Pete and I are talking about are collections because production is just... Because we're it's, getting rid of the, yeah. the production in our vernacular? Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. So she was doing you know, pretty good numbers, and she resigned halfway through the year, and I figured 19 was going to get you know, the crap kicked out of it. And really what it did was it, two things. Number one, my top hygienist, my hygiene lead, we, we established a leadership position that was Brittany. So Brittany was a lead, was created as a leader and her goal. Who were, is coming to the summit for the hygiene track, right? Yeah. So, yep. so um, Brittany became the lead and I said, Brittany, I want you to grow the department. And she goes, well, what's my budget? What can I do? And I gave her, we mapped out all that stuff and, um, we created a goal for the hygiene department. And the first thing Brittany did was she got on a plane with Ashley from my office because Sharissa in your office, who's also going to be part of the hygiene track is a, a hygienist that collects 500 grand a year. And I, I know that the average dental practice does 687. Is that, that's that correct? 650 or 687? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the so, average practice in the United States does yeah $650,000 a year. Yes. So Sharissa, your hygienist is producing more than the average doctor in the United States and almost as much as the whole practice. So I said, it's probably worth it to have an immersive exercise. There's nothing better than immersion. If you go to the Holiday Inn and learn from Sharissa, it's not going to be as powerful as actually getting into the practice and seeing mm -hmm. how she does. And Brittany credits Teresa with what she calls the four minute mile. She didn't realize what was possible. So Brittany was probably doing two hundo at the time, um, which is respectable and good. And uh, saw Sharissa and her mind was like completely wide open. She saw what was possible and saw the level of care that Sharissa was providing her patients. Sharissa is not just doing bloody prophies and, and that type of thing. She's actually getting into the diagnostics and the, and the conversation and there's perio protect, there's nutrition counseling. So that was it's the a first whole gamut. Yeah. The oral cancer screening, like there's a whole methodical pathway and that's really why um, we really had, you know, that's why we really wanted them to come teach a track at the summit is because it's just a different level of the practicing from the way I grew, uh, from the way I started in dentistry, Craig, honestly. Um, it used to be that, you know, we really had super glad, supervised neglect for so long. Like, you know, how many, how many cleanings go on in dentistry that are just literally blood shows and you need a transfusion. And like, you think you're doing them a service by going underneath the gum and, and, and doing stuff. But exactly. in actuality, you're performing a bacteremia. Exactly. Like that's all it is. It's not, you're not helping anybody out. If anything, you're putting people at risk because of, you know, you're, you're inducing a bacteremia and causing pain in the process. Like puffy gums hurt when you scrape on them. Yeah. People don't like that. Right. And so we just kind of shifted our whole philosophy on the, on the, and it never made sense for me, honestly, from a, I come from a, my degree was in, my undergrad degree was in a microbiological, uh, I got my major in microbiology. And so it never made that. sense to me 
on from a micro level, like what the hell are we doing in dentistry? Like how, how does this make any sense? Um, well, you need, a, you, just, you need a different level of education, a different level of um, self-esteem because at the end of the day, a lot of providers don't recommend the treatment that they believe is right because they don't have the self-esteem and they don't want to get rejected. So if a patient comes into the practice and says, yeah, um, you know, my old dentist, they never prayer probe me. So I don't really want to do that. Or, um, you know, I just left my dentist in New York and he says, all I need is a cleaning. And meanwhile, they get subgenital calculus everywhere. Mm-hmm. You have two different dilemmas right there. Either lean into it, educate the patient and face your fear of being rejected or, um, you know, back away from it and just, you know, but there's a bigger fear there, Craig, I'm glad you're unpacking this because if you're now adopting new philosophies, right, where you're saying, Oh, this is what we want to do. And then the patient at your next exam, you present all this high tech, what we know now kind of information. And they say, well, you, you know, what about the past 10 years you've been doing it this way? Why, why now? I haven't changed anything at home. I haven't changed brushes. I haven't changed diet. I haven't new medication. Why now doc? And so, you know, there's a good, there's a good verbiage. And that's what Sharisa and Brittany will be teaching is like, you can, you can, you can walk your way out of situations like that by saying something like, well, re- what we know now from a research, yeah. research perspective is this, and what we've just discovered and new science indicates this, right? So you're not, you know, just because you did something that way five years ago, doesn't mean that you have to do that in perpetuity until the day you die of practice, right? Like we're supposed to be evolving and growing as a practice or as individuals from a science perspective. And so I think it's fair to just say, look, you know, yeah, we thought this was the best way five years ago, but now we know. Right? I mean, people, I think the consumers being as accustomed to that as well. I mean, look at the fads and the diets and, you know, five years ago it was this and now it's this and we're learning things all the time. Mm-hmm. So I th- think it's just, you know, people understand that medicine is progressing and dentistry is progressing. And, you know, most, most consumers know the systemic uh, oral link, you know, what happens in the mouth doesn't just stay in the mouth. Well, it was on the cover of time magazine, I believe. Right. Or yeah, was that was some... a while ago though. So right. it's, it's becoming fairly, uh, you know, commonplace and, and commonplace so... for physicians to indicate now, like thank physicians, God, by the way, thank, thank God. God. Right. Like I have more physicians send us people for pre authorization for intubation and surgical procedures um, than ever before, which is yeah. fantastic. And it, and really, if you're not, if you're a surgeon and you're not doing that, like it's a great CYA, you know, they're covering their ass and I think it's great, right? Make sure the mouth is healthy, healthy before you induce, you know, see before you start cutting wide open on people. Um, because yep. as we know, there's a huge correlation, not just a, from a surgical uh, success percent, percentage, but also, um, you know, your cardio inflammation and yeah, all that. It's just, it's just crazy. No, it's incredible. Um, but I think that it takes, it takes a hygienist lifting herself up to another level to have the idea that I'm not just this, you know, person that scrapes crap off of teeth, but I'm, I'm an integral part of the health of the patient. And when they come from is that they don't, they won't get, they won't get the same resistance because so you know the how same, we talk same about difficult patient can be in two different hygienist hands. So you and, know how we talk about fulfillment, Craig. I'm 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 going to stop you there because I because this is going to be your wheelhouse. So you know we talk like imagine if you were just like womp 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 going to work today to scrape tartar like that's all I do. Imagine like coming in and being like I'm going to save lives and 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 it's a different fulfillment to your day that you it's a more purposeful hygiene and that's what that's what we wanted you know our bulletproof hygiene to represent is you know we call it purposeful hygiene what's the tagline we've kind of come up with Craig purposeful passionate hygiene personal yeah because it's literally hygiene with purpose as opposed to just like yeah. oh well know, we're just going to maintain this disease I read something this morning that really resonated with me it was um um it was the position versus your mission. So your position, people get in, you know, in, enrolled in a, in a company, they're working somewhere and they get burnt out because every time they go, they're like, they look to their task. So the hygienist can say like, oh, I get to scrape teeth today. You know, whereas their mission is to help people live healthier lives. And when you have a position that, or a mission that's, that resonates with that, you're really not, you're, you're working for something and not just for a paycheck, you're working for meaning. And those are the people that are happiest. And I just think the fact that we get to go to the same place every day and we have to go to the same place every day, there's a law of familiarity that gets to work at you and you start. This happens with professional baseball players. I mean, I have a, a friend who's a very well-known baseball player 
and I was talking to him and he's like, you know, cause my son's in little league and my son is all about little league. He wants to like sleep with his baseball glove. He's all excited about the game and that you, you do that because you want to, you, you love the game. And then suddenly someone gives you a large paycheck and then you have to do it. Mm-hmm. It's extrinsic versus intrinsic motivational factors. It's why if you picked up Moby Dick right now and read the book cover to cover, you'd actually freaking enjoy that book. But in eighth grade, when you had to read it, or 10th grade, mm-hmm. when you had to read it, it was the worst thing you ever had to read in your life. That's so it, it's just something that has to do with, you know, re, always centering on your mission. And I think what's created our hygiene departments on fire and what we hope to create for the hygienists attending the Bulletproof Hygiene uh, Summit in, in Houston is centering their, their, their mission again, centering themselves on that mission. Because Charissa and Brittany are super passionate about it. And, um, and, and Pete and I believe, not, not to take anything away from the summit, but Pete and I really believe that of all the things that people are going to learn, if you bring your hygienist, it'll be worth your tuition times 10 just for that. Because we can see all the hygienists in our practice grew. So it wasn't just the superstar Charisse or superstar. Yeah, it's a rising tide. Every single one grew. And I'm not talking about like 50 grand. I'm talking about by 100 grand. A rising tide floats all ships. And there's a correlation, Greg. I, I, I think I said this before we hit record, but you know that doesn't just live in a silo by itself of like, okay, cool. Like restorative goes up in proportion, right? Enrollment goes up in proportion. It's not just, you know, it's a rising tide for all things, even a restorative and cosmetic aspect as well. Um, so it, it would behoove everybody to really, you know, and, and I have to say, I have to give, I have to give the AIH organization a lot of credit. Like I actually helped found that organization in a small room with five people. And now What's it's it stand for AIH, the, the, the um, American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. Cool. That's the meeting that, that was in Nashville that Brittany mm-hmm. and um, yeah. So we sent our hygienist to that too. I'm glad you cool. didn't just quit. I'm glad I didn't just blow that as an AI. That would have been like the worst founding member ever. To, uh, well, I mean, how long did it take me to realize it was the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast, not the Bulletproof Dental story. Podcast? Yeah. You used to send people to the wrong domain. <laughs> I've done that before in a video. <laughs> Were you associated with a different podcast? Like, welcome, everybody. It's, I'm Bulletproof. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, dude, that's the coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, I, but that actually was, a, was one introduction into kind of eyes wide open. And you can't, I, that couldn't, after... After being introduced to philosophies with among Ayash, I, I couldn't unring the bell in my head. Right. And I want to so- talk about. Uh, sorry, I want to talk about one other thing too. While we're while we're talking about this, it's just that you know, there's a lot of hygienists out there that say like, well, it's illegal for me to diagnose something, and I agree that you know you can't say, hey, Mrs. Jones, you have a cracked tooth. We're going to do a a core and crown on this, and blah blah blah, and this is what you're going to get. And hey, doc, come in and do it. But there, that's one spectrum. But the other side is that hygienists understand i mean my hygienists in this office they understand so much they know when there's collapsed bite they know when there's a fraction totally. from occlusion they are so damn smart and and i always want them to share their concerns and one of the things get, gets a lot of dentists slash hygiene teams in trouble is hygienist says hey mrs jones i am concerned about blah 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 doctor comes in and says no jane that's not an issue at all. And I don't appreciate you talking to patient yeah, about blah, blah, blah. Like you're, dentists get right. butt hurt by a yeah, hygienist even right. talking about. Right. Per- so, like, wait so a second, imagine, you're just a hygienist. You can't imagine, diagnose. Imagine like, this conversation. Hey doc, um, I'm just reviewing a uh, patient's chart and, and I just did their cleaning. And doc, I'm concerned because she has some infractions here. And I think it's could be. Is it? Do you think it's because of toothbrush abrasion, or could it be that the teeth are lingually inclined and and there's a fraction going on? Wait, let's role play. Let me be the doctor. Okay, yeah. You want to be bad doctor or good? Let doctor? me be bad doctor. Okay, right. Hi, doctor. Yep. I just. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hi, doctor. I just finished up with the cleaning today, and Jane, she's doing great. I'm a little caught. I'm a little concerned about like this. What I think is an amalgam down on the lower. It looks like really dark around the margins. Is that a concern for you? I look at the, check out the x-ray. See a little bit of halo around the dark amalgam there. Uh, is, that a, is that an issue for you or should we not be concerned about that? Jane, honestly, uh, this is bad doctor. Jane, you, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I don't see it being a concern and, and really I'm the one who should be diagnosing as the, as the doctor entering the room. So Mrs. Jones is not a concern right now. Um, we're going to watch that. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to put, we're gonna put eyes on that and watch it at your next recall. Sorry about that. Yeah. And then that bad doctor would also go in. If that was bad oncologist, by the way, uh, Mrs. Jones, you have a little fleck of um, it's, hard, it's hard for me cancel. to be bad doctor. I'm just I know, say. but you did a good job. Let you me do a, good. You doctor. have a little. You have a little fleck of uh, cancer in your lung. I'm gonna get a chest X-ray in five years and see if it metastasizes to your brain, and then mm-hmm. we'll do radical surgery on you. Because we're the only doctors that want to watch stuff get worse. By the way, so let me be good doctor. Okay, 
uh, hey, doctor, just finished up and, you know, blah, 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 amalgam, leaking amalgam. I'm a little concerned about it. Yeah, Jane, absolutely. Great eyes on that. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, Ms. Jones, you know, we're not really concerned about this abfraction, although, you know, I commend our hygienists for doing thorough pictures and, and really pointing this out. But at this point in time, it's really probably not a concern. Oh, perfect, um, by the way. So that's a great one because when you don't agree, you want to commend them. I see why you thought that. And that's mm -hmm. totally, I could see it too, but I'm not as concerned because, you know, we can, always, we can look at that later. A patient will send another patient to a hospital and, and there's a lot of correlation between hospitals and dental practices. It's not the quality of care, perceived quality of care. It's the perception of how well the team gets on together, gets, gets along well together. So there's a book by Culp um, called If Disney Ran Your Hospital. And they did a bunch of studies about what is the number one thing that patients relate their satisfaction to the hospital experience. It is the perception of how well the auxiliary team gets along with the doctors. Mm -hmm. So if you are being snappy with your team at a, at a clinical environment, they won't like you or them or the whole practice. And to make it bring another point, I have actually heard this scenario after that doctor has left the room. I didn't appreciate the, you know, and the patient would say, I didn't appreciate the way he talked to you right there. Like they will oh, actually say stuff yeah. and saying, I am not doing treatment with that. I am not doing treatment. They will almost like rebel, like, cause they're ace in the hole or, or their power card is like doing treatment or not. Like I'm not doing treatment with that doctor because I don't appreciate the way he just spoke to you. Yeah, it's so true. Have you ever heard and that? that Oh God. Yeah. Unfortunately yeah. I have. <laughs> unfortunately, it's not a fun thing to hear, but there's, there's two things. I mean, there's unconscious and conscious leadership. There's what you're actually saying and there's the gruff nature, you know, people perceive, you know, 80% of communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not what you're saying, but if you're in a grumpy pants attitude, you're through the instruments and you're like, oh, you know, Jane, could you get me the instrument? Oh, I asked you the same thing yesterday. You know, you're not, or, or, you know, this is the same exact situation as yesterday. How are we not getting a lot? How do we not understand this? Yeah. And, and, so, and a lot of times you hear those conversations going on above the patient's head. I like, know, nothing it's, worse. It's right. Like what I, I tell my team, Greg, I was like, when there's a, we are on stage, this is a performance. Always. This is a performance. And so this isn't like just having, you know, if you want to have dialogue like that, it happens outside the room. You know, we can have a, a, but when you're, in, when you're in there, it's a performance. It really is. And the performance is to benefit the patient having a great experience, just like if they were going to see Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that, by the way. I got to see I Hamilton. I'm just, that was the only show. I'm not, a big, uh, I'm not a big Broadway person, so that was the only show I knew. Um, you, can you see me in like a Broadway play, Craig? Like just sitting uh, yeah, acting in one? I could definitely see fascinating. that. Fascinating. I think you're a closet thespian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like an actor, you know, you're definitely one of <laughs> I might be. I might that's be not a, a word we oftentimes use. Thespian. thespian. That's just, that's yeah. such a fun word to say. It is. It's a great word. Um, I um, all right, buddy. Well, anything else? I think we've beaten that. that um, Any that questions? Word. We're live oh, actually, on Facebook. You know go what? ahead and ask us. Any questions you've got, uh, so, go ahead and ask so us. So this uh, is the reason, actually, we are. So we talk about the hygiene track, but literally we are launching or, or our gals are launching Bulletproof Hygiene because of all these things we kind of talked about. So literally uh, its own, it, it will piggyback into the Bulletproof Dental Practice, right? But it's going to be bulletproofhygiene.com. There will be a landing page. They're going to have teaching and education to really help go next level. And, and probably, Greg, will always have a little summit who knows? I mean, there's so much while it grow ours, but we, you and I saw this massive void in the industry. Like I don't, I, we asked each other, like, who's the, who's the, who, who, yeah, are, who like, would you send a hygienist to? Like when someone's asked me like, who can I send my hygienist to? I'm like, Ish. I was like, I don't know. So there's like a void know. in the space. There used to be some people, but like, I know they've retired or sold or whatever. Um, but who's teaching like modern, like comprehensive, complete health dentistry with with amazing collection and trends and, and, and also from people who are actually in the field so that are in evolving. the field right? yeah because there's an immersive uh, exercise as well i mean what, what's beautiful is that you know as part of the the summit if they can have some form of immersive exercise where they can go in and actually watch because i think it was super powerful is when Brittany went up to sharisa for the day mm -hmm. she came back on fire and everything changed from that because it's one thing you know, classroom learning and you say, well, my you patients can't are different. The bell, in, but yeah. I mean, that's my when... patients are different in Florida and seeing people maneuver. Like I just had x-rays, you know, three years ago. I, why do I need them today? And all those little nuances of how patients reject you. Uh, and the good ones don't get rejected by, by, by a disagreement or by a lack of alignment between a patient. Um, you can learn a lot from that. That's great. That's great. We should go live. Are people able to like ask questions? We should go live yeah. on Facebook more. They are. Yeah. We've we got, uh, questions. yeah, we've got 
15 or so people watching on Bulletproof Dental Practice. Mm -hmm. um, but I hosted it to other places as well. Oh, nice. I just don't know what I'm doing here. So, yeah, but if we, you have a we, question. And we need to get like a, a full-time IT person just to help us with um, videos and all this stuff. Well, you know what you're doing, man. I do not. You're my full-time IT person. Hey, hey, you will not delegate to me. You do not delegate to me. No? Like um, all right, buddy. Well, I got uh, anything else? No, I'm fired up about um, um, Summit coming up. I'm fired up about what the hygienists are doing. I'm fired up that uh, we have our friendship and our relationship that enables us to grow. And it's cool that what we are pioneering in our own lab um, we are now giving forward to the people. I was on a Paul Etchinson uh, podcast uh, a couple of days ago. He's like, describe Spodite Dental Group. And I'm like, well, it's kind of like a big lab. It's I thought that was good, actually. I heard that. You were like, it's a big lab where I get to do experiments live and see if they work or not. And I was like, that is actually true because you don't have it figured out. I don't oh, have good. it figured no, out. No, no. Right? Um, but I think figuring something out creates boredom. I mean, today I've got, I've, I'm, I brought in an oral design. But you and I have kind of like a mastermind together almost, right? Like yeah, we, we do. We, we combined do our labs and like, hey, the data works. And, and yeah. so that's why, you know, I think masterminds are a great idea because I think, it, you know, it's a, especially in dentistry. because it, Well, that's it, what you and I have. You and I have Right, that. but and it's rare, have, rare that to, you get to collaborate without there being any multi- uh, motive other than like, I just want you to win. Right. And you want me, me to win. And I think, you know, um, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a cool lab. So I think we get to combine data points from both of our labs, if you will, in different yeah. capacities. Um, for sure. The for other sure. thing, Greg, I will say I'm excited about is that, you know, you and this is doubling down on what you said, but you know, you and I learned so much even just from these summits, right? Cause, because now we're up to, I think there's 150 people coming to this summit which is great. You know, the St. Regis called and said, you guys need to, you need to pipe down and um, stop having people come because they, we ran out of the room blocks. <laughs> but I mean, you know, there's going to be just so much knowledge in the room. And, and, yeah. and I'm looking at some of the, the folks who are coming, who I know some and who I've known of some, it's just like, like the caliber of folk that's coming is amazing. Like these are people all wanting to go next level. And I think, you know, going back to a rising tide, even just being around folks like that. Oh, right? I know. It's product, totally cool. You're the product you know, of it's... the people that you choose to hang out with. And, and For sure. I, know, I know it's a thing to say the product of the five people, but there is some, extrapolation to just being around. Well, these are all people awesome. that have growth mindset too. So there's growth versus fixed mindset. These are people mm -hmm. that are in growth mindset. They're like, I don't have all the answers. I want to learn. And by the way, they're all kicking butt. Right. Like, uh, what's his name? Troy's coming again. Troy, Troy, Troy uh, is coming. And I want to, yep. he texted well, me, he texted me saying, yeah, he said, he's sending it's him and four people. He said, I was canceling my I had a course. I mean, I had two people tell me they're canceling some clinical course coming to ours. And he said to us, he brought his practice from 5.2 to 7 million. He's like, thank you for breaking down the barriers for myself. But this guy is a rock star. So well, too, Craig, I want to point out something that like, just because like, so how many times you heard like, I'm pretty good, you know, in my practice, but like, there's really no such thing as coasting, which I always say. Yeah, right. And so you have, if you want to, if you like where you are, it is incumbent upon you to learn the 2020 marketing, the 2020 leadership, that like things that are going to happen because there's no such thing as you being okay in this digital age. The world, like, I, like my podcast I record, the world is moving around us so freaking fast. So if you like where you are, you still have to grow, if that yeah. makes any sense, right? A hundred percent, unfortunately. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. There's no such thing as like, oh, cool. Let's just let's just chill out now. Like you chill out, and you will be out of business. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you look at the most iconic people, and you see what they do in their private lives. I'm really blessed to have a personal relationship with Tony, and I watch Tony Robbins. And I get to see what he does. Dude, I couldn't do what he does in a week. I couldn't do in, in six months. And not, not that I'm, I'm not saying a defeatist. I just don't have the drive to do that. I tap out. You know, you see these professional athletes, what they do behind closed doors. I just, I can't, I mean, I just don't have the drive what's in them. I mean, I know it's relevant because Kobe just passed, but that guy was the hardest working man ever. You know, he didn't I have just watched a, that he, movie last night. Kobe Bryant Muse. Have you seen that? No, but I watched the uh, Patrick, but David interview with Kobe. Mm. Uh, we had Patrick, but David on the podcast. Thanks to Pete, but He's like, look, I had a 40 inch vertical. I'm six foot, you know, six. Like foot he's like, I didn't have the biggest hands, right? Yeah. But my hands were good. You know, he like, he, you're right. He went into all these things and he had sh all these shortcomings, but like his grit 
Yeah, yeah but how many of us, my, my shortcomings sometimes suppress me and squash me. So I, can, I go through phases where I, I succumb to my shortcomings and I, I, I let the internal dialogue dominate my narrative. And, you know, it, it's, it's just good to be around other people like yourself and, and the people that attend the summit that get to push us to another level. And there's a, there's a responsibility in us because if we're leading these people, we have to reinvent ourselves as well. And one thing I want to talk about, Tony, which is kind of funny, Tony was asked one time, like, how are you so good at this stuff? He's like, I go to like 15 seminars a year or no like 100 way. seminars a year. I, and they're his own. So he was saying, oh. like, I, he's like, <laughs> I attend all my own seminars. Like I have to be in the power. I have to be on position. point. Right. And, and that is kind of true, actually. You know, and he does a lot of prep for that, right? And making sure he's bringing current information. Just like you and I have prepped for this summit. Like, you know, it's incumbent upon us to make sure we're delivering amazing intel to people coming. They're spending their time, yeah. their money away from their family, time away from their practice. Like, you know, yeah. bring the value that just like Tony does. So you have yeah. to make sure you're bringing it from a whole lot of levels. I'm um, going to bring it today. How are you going to bring it? I don't know. Just be there for my team, support my team, encourage them to be their best. Leaders grow their leaders. That's our job. Beautiful. That's, That's what be I'm saying. Quote. That's going to be the quote of the podcast. Leaders grow other leaders. All right, buddy. All right, man. Good to see you. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll see you soon.